we are always thrilled. We are always thrilled to welcome back our, our guests from today. Uh, they are part of Oregon's family. And Yvonne and uh, Patty are uh, passionate about uh, the improvement of the quality of occupational uh, therapy. Again, uh, they've led us through quality indicator workshops, um, have been here for our conferences. And today they're talking about a topic um, that is near and dear to us as those who uh, try and help in supporting your uh, goals for professional development. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to invite Yvonne and Patty to start sharing and telling us how we can make and develop um, meaningful PD. All right, well, welcome. Thank you so much, Deb, for that really welcome um, invitation to us. We're happy to be here again and um, excited to share a little bit more information about um, writing meaningful professional development plans. We've actually had the opportunity to have conversations with a number of folks um, about uh, professional development plans. And we've been really um, offered the opportunity to see some of the fruits of that work. Um, and so we're happy to have, you know, to kind of present again some of the information that we have pulled together based on the work that we've done together um, on quality indicators and how it can really help us kind of propel us forward in in terms of our own sort of professional development goals and plans. So thanks again, I'm Patty Lavador. I am the program director for an OTD program on the East Coast. So it's always fun to, um, to interact again um, with all of you. I am, uh, I'm an occupational therapist that has been in school-based practice um, from ac across the range of roles and responsibilities. And one of the reasons why this topic is so meaningful to me is I served for a number of years as a program manager for, uh, for, for a large school practice in Northern Virginia. So, um, so understanding, um, understanding the quality of the services that we're providing and promoting professional development within that context is near and dear to me. I think you're muted. Yep. There we go. I'm Yvonne. And again, I'm, I'm thrilled to be back. I've gotten to interact with um, ties and echo ties in a variety of ways over the years and always enjoy being able to connect with colleagues across the country. So um, yeah, and I think Patty and I've spent a lot of time talking about this whole piece of professional development plans. And I know we've all had the experience of um, either not being observed or being observed and being told, oh, it looks like you're doing what everybody else does, or um, just being told quickly write two goals down and and never getting to go back and look at it. And so really our um, heart and intent in all of this is how do we um, write professional development plans so they're mean not only meaningful to us and that help in the evaluation process, but also so that it allows for more effective services for the children and um, school districts that we're serving. So hopefully we'll be able to provide some framework and some ideas um, for doing that, and really encouraging us to move beyond just, you know, what's two quick goals we want to write down, but really how do we sit down and make this a meaningful process that leads to good outcomes for everybody? So, um, so we're going to start, and and um, Yvonne sort of mentioned what our overarching objectives are. We want to talk a little bit about what are the tools that we need um, to to really promote these um, professional development plans that that empower us, that change us, that change practice, and um, and we know that that requires a certain amount of intentionality and. Um, but beyond that, um, some process steps, like how, you know, how do you actually do that? How do you identify those priorities? And then what are those process steps that, um, that, that you need to take in order to, um, to, to develop those? So we wanted to share with you some of those, um, the tools that we have discovered to be really effective in this process, and then leave you with some ideas on how to prioritize your own um, 
set of, of uh, needs and interests in your school divisions. So, um, so we, we kind of have started this work and, and you, you might've heard us talk about this in the past, but we started this work around the challenges that we felt um, we were all facing as occupational physical therapists in school settings. Um, and and then just as Yvonne alluded, um, we often find ourselves in places where we are not evaluated by OTs or PTs. The other people are evaluating us. And we we felt like we needed some, some tools, some resources to think differently about um, how we communicate those distinctions with the people that um, we work with. So we know that we work in settings that are really complex. They require really complex professional reasoning. And sometimes that's hard to articulate to the people that, um, that are evaluating us or to those that we, with whom we want to affect change. We know that there are often, um, we experience lack of common standards in order to really articulate, me measure and articulate those changes that we would like to see in our schools. Um, we develop competency on the job and thankfully um, you all have ECHO, ECHO ties to help you with that endeavor. But um, but oftentimes we, we lack the full range of uh, resources that we need to really articulate what how we're prioritizing our our um, plans and our contributions and what our distinct value is. How am I uniquely changing the face of service delivery for the, the students that I serve? Um, and then again, we're often evaluated by people that are outside of our profession. Um, and that and those performance measure, measures are often inconsistent with our um, with our scopes of practice. I know that has happened to me a lot in my state um, where those distinctions are entirely different. And I'm measured ac across metrics that don't have really anything to do with the actual work and contributions that I make in my school division. And so, um, and so we're, we're at this kind of threshold where there's this gap between what we what we know about the work that we do, what we use in practice, and how we're able to communicate that and prioritize that with um, the 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 folks that we we work with, and we I think we we can kind of all agree that these gaps in our practice and in, in our practice advocacy really results in a number of really pretty significant negative impacts. For example. Um, it in fact, it impacts our service delivery, right? We might be not using the right interventions. We might adopt or overuse treatments that are just not um, appropriate. Um, we might deliver unnecessary care. Um, we might miss, and, and perhaps the most salient from my lens is we might miss opportunities to introduce those really effective interventions that will make a change, they'll make an appropriate change for our students. Um, <clears throat> satisfaction always is on the forefront um, when we're not able to really articulate our contributions and tell people, here is what I uniquely bring to the school system um, that impacts satisfaction or the, the, the satisfactions that others have with us. Um, could it, it could impact cost effectiveness. It could affect our own credibility. Um, how we see ourselves and how others see us in the context of um, how we're able to prioritize and discuss our contributions. Um, and we just generally have that mismatch, mismatch um, experience. So we really need to close the gap, both in terms of how we're using information and then sharing and articulating our contributions relative to the work that we do. When we close the gap, we know that the effectiveness, the fidelity and the um, efficacy of the work that we're doing increases. And so of course our clients get improved, right? Whether that client is the students directly in front of you, whether it's the teacher, whether it's the school district as a whole, um, progress is achieved when we can effectively prioritize, develop our plans, our plans to develop ourselves 
um, and articulate and, and share what those outcomes are looking like for, for, um, for our clients. Client participation increases, right? Students are able to more effectively participate in the roles that they want to and need to participate in. Um, what I have found is as I get cleaner in my development plans, um, I get better at being able to communicate with teams and families about, um, about those priorities and about what those outcomes are of my development plan. And I guess, lo and behold, right, we feel better. I feel better when I have a really good um, professional development plan and I can see the outcomes at the end of that plan. I can see the when I achieve the goals that I set out to achieve. So we um, are all about, uh, this presentation all about, is all about this idea of closing the gap, how we better articulate the ways forward, the strategies forward in developing an effective professional development plan. So um, Yvonne and I have used uh, the, the quality indicators, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, a, a lot um, over the last numbers of years to really help look at our own practice and help others look at their practice. And there seems to be three main tools that continually come up in the way in the way of conversation um, that help us to be more effective at developing professional development plan. The first is the practice resources, the second is reflection, and the third is professional reasoning. And we're gonna just talk about those three tools um, briefly before we get into what the actual process um, steps are for developing a professional development plan. Mm -hmm. So the first is um, professional resources. So, um, you know, we've, Yvonne and I have talked uh, at length about the quality indicators. Um, we think that that using clear clinical sort of practice guidelines and quality indicators that really support best practice can be a, a very, very helpful first step for you in establishing um, ideas and priorities about a professional um, development plan. We've posted in the folder for today's presentation, the, um, the quality indicators that we developed for OT. Um, and we've also posted the, the PT competencies that were developed in um, the 2010s, I think, um, by Susan Efkin and her group. Um, so those, those tools are available to you. But, but what they provide for us, again, is that sense about what does practice look like? What ought, might it look like under, um, under ideal circumstances? And they provide for us an established, agreed upon standard of care. It's based on literature, based on our science. And when we use tools like that in a really reflective way, um, we know that it improves the consistency of the care that we're providing. Um, it reduces our inefficiencies. It, um, it, it eliminates sort of some of the roadblocks that we think we, that we encounter when we're um, addressing healthcare and educational service delivery. And what we know about um, professional resources like the quality indicators and the PT competencies is that when they're um, integrated into our own um, reflective practice and into our own um, professional reasoning, it sort of closes that gap. It helps us to think differently about the services that we're providing, and it helps us be more clear about what the priorities are for our teams. Um, and so we can clearly find and identify what are those outcomes that we need to be focused on um, and how can they really change the practice that we are engaged in. Um, so what these quality indicators and competency guidelines are, they're simply a roadmap. Um, they're not a, an, a test, they're not an assessment, they're not, a, they're not designed to say you're good or bad or something, they're just a roadmap to help guide your reflection and your professional reasoning. They help you sift through in a really iterative way 
how um, you can look at your practice and define it and articulate what about this practice is really strong. What other areas do I need to focus on or what areas can I, um, how can I reinforce in the way of my interests um, and needs? So um, they help to really expand the full domain of our occupational and physical therapy practice in schools. They're not, again, meant to be prescriptive. Again, they're not sort of check off the box and see what I'm good and not so good at. They're not to be um, considered stagnant or inflexible. They're not limited to any specific kind of framework, whether, uh, you know, across any of the domains of of engagement that we work with, with uh, children and youth and their teams. So, um, so again, they're really tools to help promote reflection of your practice and promote that kind of reasoning pathway for you to be thinking about what are my areas of in high interest, high strength, high need, and where I might prioritize goals for myself and my team. So again, we've posted those in the folder so you can have access to them um, as, as you need them. And, um, and we encourage you to kind of take a look at them. But they live within this broader scope of array, an array of sources of knowledge that we have. Um, the key, um, The key that we need to be thinking about is how do we analyze and translate that uh, that knowledge, that evidence to our practice. Um, and once again, the quality indicators and the competencies are designed to help us do that work. Um, so we know, uh, for those of you that have spent any time thinking about how we, how we somehow bring our knowledge to our practice, we know that there's lots of different ways that we kind of think about this idea. Um, most you know, we, I, we've got a bunch of the words up here, diffusion of knowledge, knowledge exchange, et cetera, are many of the theories that are available to us. But the, the bottom line is we need to be thinking about how do we translate our evidence, whether that evidence is related to treatment interventions, whether that evidence is related to practice competencies or areas of quality, um, they, the key here is these, these strategies, these um, theoretical approaches really help us describe how we're going to translate that information into our practice. It helps us to think about what are the influences on our practice and how um, our shift in thinking and how our shift in understanding things in a different way can really make an impact on um, on student outcomes. So to apply knowledge, of course, we need that second tool, right? So we've got these really effective guidelines, but we now need, in order to really be an effective translator of knowledge and, uh, and, and apply knowledge to our own professional practice or um, our work with children and youth, we need that second tool, the tool of reflection. Um, reflective practice, as you can see here, it's, it's, um, you know, we've all been, we've all done a reflection, um, it, it, depending on, you know, it all sort of depends on how explicit that reflection is, but it really is the process of learning through our experience and gaining insights of ourself or our practice, utilizing those reflective, um, strategies. It's looking at oneself in the mirror and being conscious of what, what we're doing. Um, it requires us, and I, I, I always think about the um, sort of the metaphor be coming up to a stop sign or even to a yield, right? It causes us to slow down, become more conscious of, um, of what's happening. It's that slowing down, which is a, which is a hard commodity in school practice, right? Um, but it's that slowing down, it's that pausing that we do that really enables us to learn and to change our practice. Um, it's, it's when, again, when we're gaining that insight of what we're doing and how we're framing um, and how we're kind of thinking about 
what worked, what didn't work, what might we do better in, um, in our understanding and in our, um, in our context. So it helps build our self-awareness. It helps us really be attentive to the care that we're providing. And it expands our clinical knowledge and our skills. It slows us down and it helps us to be able to, and I think perhaps the most important thing, it helps us to be able to reframe what we're doing and then be able to explain it to others. When we can do that, um, that's, I think, when we really make the difference between um, these are these are things that I'm, you know, that I'm doing, and these are the things that I want to prioritize to do differently or to do better. Um, so that reflection enables us to to think about and put in place action steps that um, that that change our practice. So I, I think about. Um, I, I think about the many, you know, workshops like this that we sit in and we listen and we frame and we, we, you know, try to integrate that, that knowledge, but it's when we stop and pause and give sort of, as I have here, give our brain that opportunity to just slow down, untangle it, reorganize it, consider all of the different arrays in the context of our own practice that we can then sort of say, okay, how can I think differently about this and what might be some of the priorities for myself in the context of professional development planning? So, um, so again, that reflection gives us opportunity to professionally engage. When we slow things down, we can see the signposts better, right? We can see the cues that are in our environment and we can start to really think about what are the interactions, what are the relationships, what are the affordances and these restraints that exist within my physical and social environment that will enable me to make a change in my practice. Um, it helps us to really think about um, what we are engaged in doing and what the outcomes are that we are uniquely bringing to that situation. I find that that in school practice, that's the hardest part, right? It's because there's such an oftentimes such a integrated team, people that are all on the same page working together to achieve a particular outcome. It's sometimes hard for me to say what I do as the OT on this team that is unique, that is contributing uniquely to those outcomes. And so I think that that reflection empowers us to talk about that. They empower us to think about what is it that I bring? What capacities do I need to change in order for change to happen in the context of my, um, in, the, in the context of my therapeutic service? Um, so, we, within the context of reflection, have uh, thought a little bit about what are the components to building practice knowledge for ourselves and our school teams. You know, as, I, as we were putting this presentation together and as I was just listening to Patty talk, I, I can imagine um, people thinking, oh, but I just need to get this plan done and get our goals down. And um and and I totally can relate to being at that point. And and I was just reflecting on right now, one of the things we have to do um, for um, ACOAT who certifies um, programs that teach is we all have to have these professional development plans. And I've been working on mine and um, really challenging myself to step back and not just put goals down, but to put goals down that are really meaningful and um, thinking about um, what would make a difference for what I'm doing as an occupational therapist right now um, in building my knowledge, but also in um, where are places I want to see things improve or see things differently. And so the next series of slides that we've really um, put together, we're, we're not going to talk through in detail. We've put a lot of detail on the slides so that you can go to the link, um, the Google 
the, or the, do, uh, the folder that has the, uh, the resources from today's presentations and really take some time and think through these slides because one of the things that we've realized is we start thinking about reflecting on a practice and applying things to our practice and then how do you write actionable steps and what are some things we should consider is um, we also have to consider what do we write our goals around? So are our goals going to be around um, thinking about ourselves? So we could go to the next slide, Patty. Um, of so so we might really want to be thinking about what are some things I need to see for myself as a potential um, goal or a potential area for professional development. And so what we've tried to do on these slides is think about, you know, you'll see in subsequent ones other other areas besides thinking about ourselves. But what are some things to maybe reflect on? What might be a reflection question that you could use? And then what are some um, tools and resources that might help you? Uh, and so, you know, we're really advocating that a professional, a good professional development plan goes from something that you put out within an hour, half an hour to an hour to something that might take you a couple of days to think through and really document. So it might be around yourself. It might be around your team or how to build team expertise. Um, I've worked with a few therapists lately who've really wanted to kind of to take their skills, but really think about how it fits within their team as a whole. And so again, we have some things to be thinking about and then some reflection questions and some additional um, resources that you might find helpful in thinking through. Or you're the student, maybe there's some things you need to learn more about your student, but we also need to remember that our client not only includes that student that we're working with, but the other stakeholders or the other individuals working with the student, and even um, the population or the system um, as a whole to be thinking about what are those client needs and how, what can I do to deliver some of those effective services? That's a question Patty and I've been asking a lot over the last um, year that we've been working with therapists around the country because we've been hearing a lot about, well, if we could just do this at a systems level, if we could just do this for the whole group. So we've been really thinking about, you know, well, how what does it look like to really deliver effective services, not just as an individual, but um, in the system as a whole? And I think we'll be talking about that um a little bit more in a few months. And then also thinking about the barriers. That's another thing we hear a lot as we're talking with therapists, or, or, you know, well, I'd love to be able to do this, but the environment I'm in or the context I'm in, or and so maybe some of the, um, maybe your professional development plan might wanna focus around the, envi the environment and how can you leverage or create a culture of evidence-based practice um, or really overcoming some of those barriers. Uh, you know, I think of when for OT is that the OT is the handwriting teacher in the school district, but is that really an effective use of our skills and expertise? And so thinking about the environment and then finally thinking about um, external evidence and um, being involved, um, collaborating, those of you who maybe are close to a university or or who maybe want to take an OTD student and bring some um of the evidence in, I, you know, I've talked, we were at um, you know, the, the TIES conference last spring, and I talked with several of your therapists there in Oregon that are doing some really incredible things and to figure out some ways to capture that and get it out so that others can hear about the work that you're doing or that it helps build our research and our evidence around our practice. So I know I just went through those slides super quick, but um, we, put, we put a lot of information and we put reflective questions on there because we wanted you to be able to have that to go back to. And so you might be thinking, boy, I really do want to write a, a professional development plan and I want to focus on the context of the environment that I'm working at. Hopefully some of the information that we put on that slide will help with that. Because it, we really feel like that if you have um, effective reflection 
and you start building some of this knowledge translation and thinking about your professional development plans, that allows you to take kind of go from this big picture of best practices and effective outcomes to your client, to really increased um, confidence in our services as occupational and physical therapy therapists in the schools. And it also can lead to improved um, client satisfaction and outcomes. It also ends up being that we're able to um, function more in that broad scope of who we are and what we have to offer and bring um, to, to the schools. So some of the things though, as you think about reflection and taking some time for reflection, um, the research tells us that part of reflection is to allow us to self-correct. And so um, it can be uncomfortable at times. It might be that, boy, I need to change something that I'm doing. Um, but it also allows us to really kind of look at some things qualitatively and recognize some patterns and structures and think about how to be a problem solver in leading to more outcomes because otherwise we just keep doing the same thing over and over again right and um you know some people say that's the definition of insanity is when you see something that doesn't work and you just keep doing the same thing over and over but we get kind of stuck in that in that cycle because our jobs are so busy and um, right before we we started, some of us were on and um, Deb was reflecting on how many settings are not even fully staffed. And so we're just running, you know, kind of like that gerbil on the wheel, just trying to get the minimum done. But um, taking some time to sit back and think about um, and really problem solve how we can really um, be mindful and grow our practices in, in effective ways leads to better outcomes for our kids. And I would say also for ourselves because we feel better about what we're doing. So then that leads us to this next step, um, this next tool, and that is this professional reasoning. And that's how we really think when we're providing our um, services. And often our um, professional reasoning can be very implicit. Um, all of us have probably experienced watching that really skilled therapist and you're like, how did they know how to do that? Wait, what did they do? How did they get from here to there? That's that professional reasoning. But there's some advantages to pausing and making some of our professional reasoning more explicit at times. Um, really um, thinking about how are we really kind of pulling all of the pieces together as we're making decisions. Effective professional reasoning tells us that we're thinking about the client and everything that impacts that client, as well as ourselves and all of the skills and expertise we bring embedded within the, all these environmental factors. So there's a lot that can come at us. And we often think about this in really rapid and tactic ways. Like I said, it's really implicit, but sometimes having it explicit is helpful. Um, I would argue this is a good reason to take a, a fieldwork student or an OTD student, because they'll start asking, well, why'd you do that? How to, you know, and produce every once in a while you'll find yourself going, well, I've always done it that way. And if you answer that way, that's the time to give pause and think, hmm, should is it good that I've always done it that way? We kind of sometimes get our toolboxes that we're really comfortable with that we may need to um, sh shake up a little bit. Uh, when we think about expertise development, they actually tell us that continuum of expertise development, you actually start moving backwards if you're not sharing your expertise. So, um, but really thinking as you're starting to get, you've kind of done your reflection, you've thought about all these pieces, you're starting to write your professional development plan, but thinking about your professional reasoning as part of that as well. And so there's a, a variety of professional reasoning frameworks, but you really want to think about how to capture the lens of your client as well as your lens and then kind of bring into that um, thinking about some of the other stakeholders. So I'm working with this student, but what does this teacher think? Um, and how, do, how does that all play in? So uh, an example might, might be as I've really, one year I was working a lot around some of the sensory issues and how to embed sensory more as in the normal routine of the school instead of it being a pull out kind of I'm working with this kid over here, but he's not getting the sensory needs met within the classroom. 
But all of a sudden I realized all these teachers have sensory preferences as well. So now one of the, my professional development goals a number of years ago was to think about how do I help teachers who have a mismatch with the sensory preferences of a student? And what are some of the things that we can do? So thinking about those other stakeholders, we also want to think about capturing um, outcomes for our clients in participation or occupational performance and thinking about the system and the legislative issues that we have to function within. So um, right now there's a whole lot of discussion around ESSA and the role of OTs and PTs as in gen ed and how does that impact us? And if we're in a school district where there's a shortage and we can't even meet all the special ed needs and now we're being told, oh yeah, but by the way, you, you also can help support some of gen ed and how does that fit? That could be part of a professional development plan, thinking that through and what does that look like? Um, and then professional reasoning also allows us to um, prioritize um, some of the interests and challenges that we're, that we're facing. So, so you take these pieces, you take these tools, we've got these guidelines and competencies um, and we've got, we've got reflection, we've got professional reasoning. What do we do? How do, how do, what does this look like? And so this is kind of the trajectory that we've um, been playing with. It's, I'm certain that there's different things you could add into this, but um, we would um, encourage you to maybe start by reviewing the quality indicators for OT or the PT competencies we feel, or some of your practice guidelines for OT or PT, we feel like those are good places to start when you're starting to think about professional development planning, both in developing your individual plan, but maybe even in thinking about what professional development you would go to. Um, and then think about a reflective analysis of strengths and needs, thinking through some of the reflection pieces and knowledge translation pieces that we've been talking about. And then how do you prioritize that for your district, for your setting, for you as an individual? So it might be somebody who is new to school-based practice, some of those prioritizations might look different than somebody who has been practicing for quite a while. But out of that, then you can develop your professional goals and a plan. And part of your plan then might include some continuing ed choices. What continuing ed might you want to seek out? Or you might want to think about um, some collaborative learning with team members. One year in the school district where I was working, um, I was teaching at the time, so I was only working one day a week in the school district. And But we as a whole team, um, when we put our school district professional development plans together, we did them very um, consistently with some changes we wanted to work through as a team. And then we worked really collaboratively together. So we met, we had some books that we all read together. We met once a month. Um, we did all these things really deliberate. So they were individual plans, but we did them collaboratively. And then we did a lot of collaborative learning. It was a really fun year. Um, we did all our book discussions over dinner and wine. You know, we, I mean, we, we really built some things in, um, but, but learned a lot. And it was all around um, play and playfulness and how to, um, how play supports learning, because we felt like recess was going away and things were getting so structured. And I mean, I learned so much, like, for example, I'll just give one little tidbit, because this is also always just stuck with me. Um, with um, all of the technology and, and, and things becoming so structured, um, NASCAR started this first and um, now NASA does it as well. Part of their interview questions includes how people played as children because they were finding they were getting all these um, scientists and people who were really good at putting something together, but they weren't good problem solvers. They wanted instant solutions and, and play led to um, being able to deal with uncertainty and find other ways to, to uh, tackle a problem. So that has huge implications when we think about in the schools and some of the things that we might do with the kids that we're working with. And then also expansion of our roles and thinking about mentorship and be a mentor, have a mentor. 
Um, I think that's going to become one of my mantras because I find there's so much that happens in mentoring um, relationships. Patty, can we go to the next slide? Within this, then, you also want to identify, so we talked about identifying your strengths within that flow, um, thinking about, you know, um, what are your individual strengths and your organizational strengths? You might want to use, if you've ever done this process, a SWOT analysis type process, um, where you think about your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I know we do that a lot at a systems level. I've done it a couple of times just for me individually and found it really helpful because all of a sudden I'm kind of like going, I'm, I've been like trading a threat as an opportunity and then I keep hitting a, a, a roadblock and I'm like, why is this so hard? Well, it's really not an opportunity. And so maybe I need to shift my attention somewhere else. Think about how to leverage your um, strengths and leverage your full scope of practice and OT and PT's distinct value. What is our distinct value as therapists in the schools? Or if you're an assistive technology specialist, what's the distinct value you bring to that school district? Thinking um, about that as you're um, starting to pull all this information together. I just wanted to quickly um, sort of tag on to what Yvonne is, is saying. And um, one of the reasons why we frame this as identify your strengths um, is because, I, I mean, I don't know about your experience, but mine is I, I can very, very easily get a little down on myself when my professional development plan is all about get better at doing this, get better at doing that. You're not so good at this, so you got to get better at that. Um and as opposed to saying, these are the strengths that I have, these are the contributions that I that I know I can make. Um, so how can I leverage that to do things that are really great for my school division or for my for the students? So I think sometimes just reframing away from, oh gosh, you know, ho hum, I gotta get better at all these things. We those things are gonna obviously gonna appear somewhere. But if you're situating your professional development plan around those strengths, um, both and just as Yvonne said, at the individual organizational level, it becomes really empowerful, it really a really powerful tool um, that is something around which you can feel really good um, as you work on those goals throughout the year. Well, and I would add, and seeing Chandra's comment in the chat too, I would just add we can't, our scope of practice, OT and PT in the schools is so broad, we cannot be good at everything. And so if we try and be good at everything, then we're just hitting the surface. And the team, the last team that I worked with, we talked about this a lot. And so I was, I did a lot of the assistive technology for the district, but that didn't mean that I met all the assistive technology needs in the district. It meant that if uh, my colleague over here I had a student had some assistive technology needs. I went and I, I, we leveraged my strengths by helping her, but she continued to work with them. Just like that same colleague was an expert with a lot of the developmental vision issues. And so she would come help me sometimes and help me develop plans for some kids that I was working with. That allows us to go deeper and to really be able to um, meet um, students at a, a much greater level than if we're all trying to be experts at technology and autism and strength training and, you know, all these things that can that come at us. And so really what we're then talking about is kind of having this growth mindset of um, really thinking about, um, you know, a fixed would at schools talk a lot about this now too a fixed mindset is like this is how i'm at i'm really not good at i can't this is a, it's, it's just not going to get any better where a growth mindset really thinks about that we can continue to grow and change we can build on our strengths it's okay to have things that we don't do well um it, there might be some things that um we're not that we don't do well that we're not even going to focus on but that we're really um thinking about um you know, if if something doesn't work, we see it as an opportunity to continue to to grow. Um, so that's that's one of those pieces that we feel we should be thinking about within the context of our um, 
of our whole development of our professional development plan of not only asking the kids that we work with to have a growth mindset, but that we have one um, as well. And then, oh, there we go. Find a mentor, be a mentor. Um, I just really think that um, mentoring is a way, and both formal and informal, a way that can really help us as we're developing our professional um, skills and as we're continuing to grow. And especially those of us that have been in the field now for 20 Eh, almost 30 years, you know, it's really easy to get focused on everything that doesn't go right or everything that hasn't gone right. Or, you know, I um, was talking with a colleague that just retired and she was um, pulling out a bunch of her training notes and different things. And she goes, I just, I was talking about this 20 years ago and we're still talking about it. And I'm like, yeah, because sometimes change takes time. And so being a mentor allows you to sometimes kind of get that off your chest, but continue to have the um, the um, energy to continue to move forward. And um, that um, good mentor will also help support that discovery of new paths and really helping you question, ask the right questions, helping you focus on your strengths and um, all of those types of different um things. Um, Patty and I've been playing a, a lot with a, a whole idea of what's called mentoring circles, um, where uh, instead of a mentoring being that this person has lots of experience and this person doesn't, so th this person's going to impart to the new newbie. A mentoring circle is made up of individuals of um, all different um, area level. I don't like the word level. All different years of experience and all different types of life experiences. And they're all co-mentoring together, recognizing that somebody who maybe is new to the practice of school-based may have a whole lot to bring because of their experience in another practice setting or because they're what they've just learned in their educational program. And so um, we're kind of playing around with some other ways that mentoring might be able to happen where we can be more effective within the schools. Another critical component, as you started to pull all this together, you're starting to develop your plan, you, um, you, you're getting it all down, down there, um, you're getting it onto a piece of paper, is really think about how you're going to um, take some data. How are you gonna know that you're making some progress? Because again, another thing that I've heard is, oh yeah, I just write the same goal over and over again on my professional development plan. It doesn't really matter. If we're taking all the time to think about and to establish a good plan, then, then have a way that you're going to measure the outcome of that plan. Is it linked to concerns with the school? Is it linked to a program that you want to get developed in your in your school? And so has the program started? You know, whatever it might be, it can be more qualitative than quantitative. But having a way to really look at some explicit baseline and outcome data, so you can say, "Yep, I I I met this goal," or "Yep, I did this." And I just put in the chat. Um share your outcomes. I mean, I think that that is one of our biggest um, challenges. I, I Again, I can personalize this in one of my biggest challenges, and I think I see it in my colleagues as well. We do such amazing things, and in many cases, we have good data, um, but we don't tell anybody. You know, we kind of keep it to ourselves, and you, you know, share it, share it with your school and admin, share it with your, you know, school boards or whoever is willing to listen, because this, I think, makes the real difference um, in terms of our professional development plans. When we can share the outcomes that we're achieving, everybody, you know, we, we elevate the value of the service that we're providing and we feel good as well. So that's just my, um, yeah. All right. So we've talked a lot and given a lot of um, data, things to think about, but here kind of trying to summarize it into um, 
into a way to establish an action plan to really get it down. Um, so defining some of your interests and challenges, thinking through some data, <coughs> excuse me, clarify and prioritize. What do you, you can't do it all. So you might have to, if they, you've got six things, seven things that you think are um, need to be addressed, um, maybe you take the top one or two, um, write some goal statements, establish an action plan, monitor, and then share the results. There we are again. I like how Deb said, shout out your successes. It breeds more success. It really, it, it really does. It's, in, it's encouraging. But um, you've got this big professional development plan. Take some time and translate it into some sort of an action plan. How are you going to um, take some action to get to meet those goals and, um, and having some of that available to you? And then you jump right in. It's okay to take small steps. So um, back when I was trying to transition from being less in the therapy room and, and providing more of my services in more of a collaborative, in the classroom, in the school environment way, I just started with one classroom, with one teacher. I didn't start it with my full caseload. And um, and at the time, I didn't understand the... Um, I'll even use this term, the brilliance of doing it that way. I did it that way out of survival. But what happened was all the other teachers were jealous that I was in that classroom because they thought, oh, she's helping him teach. She's helping him do this lesson. Oh, look, he and it, they were coming in and observing. And pretty soon they're like, how come you're not in my classroom? Well, I would like you to come do this here. And so it really started to breed this um because they saw the benefit of it in one small way, breed that boy, this is something we want as a whole in our in our school. Um, use all the resources and the knowledge that you have, um, and your team members and other individuals. Um, I worked with one, collaborated with one group of school um, therapists, an OT and PT team, and um, they had a member of their team that loved looking up evidence and synthesizing evidence. And what they ended up doing, um, they had caseload limits in their district. They went and got permission from their um, union and they all, all the other therapists took one or two extra kids on their caseload to free up a full day for this therapist that liked looking into evidence. And then all the other therapists would just shoot their questions to her and she'd gather everything together and then give them ideas and give them the resources back. And I share that story because I think be creative. Who's your team? Who can help you? Who can help build some of those, that information? You guys have something so special here with Echo Ties. If you see something that you want more evidence or more data on, I'd be shooting that idea to Deb. And that might be something she can look at having an echo tie session on. Um, leverage some of these resources that you have available to you. Um, connect with others. And um, remember both um, successes and failures allow us to grow as practitioners. Use that growth mindset. Um, a failure or a mistake is just an opportunity to learn. Um, and, and so, yeah, keeping that growth mindset in um, um, adversity so that we can continue to move forward because that'll allow us to be a change agent. That's going to bring us to a point where practice is going to look um, better and we're going to be more effective in meeting the needs of the students we're serving. So there, um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. I know this is a lot of information. I think we could have spent a whole day as we were putting this together we kept cutting slides out we're like this is too much okay so we could have spent a whole day and it would have been so fun to to spend a day but i'd encourage you if you get your uh, professional development plan done share it with somebody you're welcome to share it with us we'd love to see some of what you're doing or some of what you're thinking with this because we really feel that this could if we can get better at doing professional development plans well, I think we can. It's another way we can have a huge impact on our um, schools, our systems, and in meeting the needs of the children and youth that we serve. The other, the other comment that I just want to add, and and I guess not necessarily add, but but highlight um, 
Yvonne said, reach out to others. And one of the things that, again, you guys have a, an amazing um, capacity for is using one another on these calls um, and, and among your teams. Um, we have seen some really amazing work coming out of collaborations that were facilitated by Deb and Chandra and the work that they do um, in supporting you. Um, I can... I, based on, again, you know, so my, my small lens of the work that you all are doing is um, if you have that idea, I am certain that somebody else in another school division, another place, another school, another setting has the same idea. And so leverage that, that similarity and leverage that common um, objective that you all have in meeting the needs of your schools and um, develop plans in collaboration with one another. Um, that, again, we've seen some just amazing um, uh, efforts that have produced a really uh, incredibly impressive results. So, um, so share, um, collaborate, and and just as Yvonne said, we're we're happy to 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 weigh in and give guidance and. Um, serve as resource and mentor to you as well. Well, I love I love this conversation. And you know, the thing is that the themes that you're talking about pop up every in every circle. So it's just reinforcing the power of collaboration and coming together at the same conversations. And when you are a one man band on the other side of the mountain, it's really hard to know what your benchmark is for anything. And when we come together through these uh, types of offerings and our town halls, uh, I really feel like we are developing a, a community of practice uh, to support each other. And when we talk about, um, you know, currently we're talking about things such as caseload and workload. And what really comes into conversation often is clarity in our roles, not just for ourselves, but also for those we work with. Um, we've talked about how administrators love to see you all come in because they go through, they've got the answers, now I can do other things. But really having, uh, what, I, what struck me was really having co that conversation with your supervisor, your administrator, and talking about the kids that are coming through and what the needs are. And so I really am thinking about this in relation to feeding because our feeding conference is next mm -hmm. week. And so we know that, for instance, part of the conversation we're going to have is about, yes, something may be part of your scope of practice. You may have had some training with it. But then when it comes down to it, if you don't have an expertise, it is unethical for you to do something that you don't have the expertise. So when you know that there's a student who may be coming up or um, just just looking at and saying, well, nobody here has what we're going to need for this student that will be here. This needs to be part of my plan because we can't say, I'm sorry, nobody knows how to do that. And so um, just really communicating those kind of things with your administrator. And I just want to say one of the things for Ova is I really loved what Fiona said about, um, you know, looking at the kids who are coming in. Uh, there is so much uh, COVID, um, I mean, it just the COVID effects and the socialization and all of those people, Fiona recognized that real, what really needs to happen is that somebody needs to get a greater handle on some of the sensory pieces because this is prevalent in her world. And what she said is she's going to a sensory health conference. Now, that to me is just a really good example of looking at your environment, seeing what's coming up for you, finding out if anybody has the expertise and then making sure that somehow you are the one who is able to get that if it can be in your wheelhouse. So it just seems like all of these things keep coming back around, uh, the need for mentoring, get clarification of roles, um, and really uh, trainings and conversations with administrators to make sure everybody knows all the things that you are able to do. So. I just wanted to summarize that in my words, but certainly open it, open it up to others who have 
um, similar or varying um, points of view, please feel free to unmute yourself. I'd really love to to hear a little bit more about specifics about what a professional development plan maybe that you guys have created for yourselves looks like. What's on your plan, Yvonne? <laughs> well, I'm working on mine right now. Um, it's it's kind of interesting to be working on that while at the same time, um, we were putting this presentation together. We have a set format we have to use. And so I have to actually link my plan to the universities and our OT department strategic goals. Um, but um, so I've been thinking a lot. Uh, my plan kind of has um, two kind of main focuses. One is around um, really thinking about our curriculum and how to prepare this next generation of OT students that are coming out. What do they need to know? Um, a lot of input from clinicians out in the community of, um, you know, how, how do we how do we match today's learner? Because as you guys, are, as we're all experiencing in the schools, right? Um, kids are learning differently and technology is impacting that. And But we still need people to be good, critical thinkers too so how do how do we do that how do we do that in the face of um of artificial intelligence so so a lot of my plan right now is around gathering some information and trying to synthesize and really thinking through some of that i'm a little i'm spoiled because i'm on a sabbatical right now so i have time to really sit back and do that um at the same time um i'm trying to layer a lot of the diversity into it so i'm reading um several books around just kind of, you know, what do we do? Most of our assessments that we use are white middle-class assessments. Are we really assessing kids fairly? And how, do, how does all that look? So, so there's that one side of my plan. And then the other side is really thinking about um, um, goals around where we're going with the quality indicators and um, really thinking about how to, how can I really help support those of you who are working day to day in the schools? I, you know, I still get to get in the schools once in a while, but not as much as I used to, but to really lead to better outcomes and more effective services. So those are what's on my, on my plan right now, as far as getting it down to definitive goals, I'm still working on that piece. It's not due to, for one more week. So I still get to play around with that bit. So I don't know about, what about you, Patty? Yeah, uh, so I have a similar thing because of the academic setting that I'm in. Um, so I, I also have an academic um, professional development plan that has similar kinds of concepts on it. Um, but I also have, I also work with, um, a, a, I live in Hampton, the Hampton Roads area in Virginia, which is the southeastern corner of the state, and it houses the most number of military installations actually in the world um, in this particular region that is about the size of Rhode Island. Um, and so it's a very, very large region. We service a lot of military individuals um, and, and I work um, in a kind of a, a collaborative group, a community of practice, if you will, um, of OTs and PTs. And one of the goals that we are um, establishing in our kind of collaborative, we have seven school divisions within this, um, this region. So across our collaboration, um, we're trying to figure out a way to establish some, um, some conformity in the way that we are supporting children of uh, families that are deployed and or are in in transition. So our my professional development plan is looking at how we can develop better resources, work in collaboration with some of the military support resources in the region to making sure that people have access to 
um, consistency across our school divisions. A lot of families are brought here that have children with disabilities because of the amount of resources. Um, so, um, so just trying to kind of link those, um, making those those resources available and and build um, build our skills as practitioners to support the needs of those those uh, those families that are in transition or are military connected. That's a big one. <laughs> How about others that are on the call? I'd be interested to hear a little bit about um, what other people have in mind for your, your professional development plans. Or did anything kind of spark? Did we spark any uh, ideas as we kind of talked this morning? Hi, Patricia. <clears throat> my name's Fiona Fiona. Um, I work with preschool kids and I've just done my plan with my supervisor. And, <clears throat> and one of the challenges that I have is how do you measure? So we use the APS too with our three to five year olds. And that's a nice measure that shows you percentage and you make a, an estimation of improvement with that. That's really clear cut. Um, but you've probably heard that I'm dealing with a lot of sensory dysregulation with our children, our COVID kids. Um, so what we're finding is we're having a lot of behaviors. And in my plan, I was trying to figure out how can I measure improvement in dysregulation? So I use the SPM2 for preschool in the classroom. And with myself and my um, supervisor, we were trying to figure out, okay, can we say something like 10% change or, you know, more, how do you do it? So we're, we're having a little play with that, but I'd love to get ideas of how can you measure. And I've picked just three children because it's a big one. Um, and I do have a plan of action and I have quick tips and I have like solution circles. So we have um, strategies and methods, but how do you collect data on something that's quite complex? Yeah. I'll oh, go ahead. Patty. Yeah, no, I was um, I I have grappled with this same sort of idea. Um, and so thank you for bringing this question up. And, um, you know, one of the things that I often think about is uh, um, is how effective can we be in terms of or how effective will our measures be in terms of really pointing out the kinds of changes that we want to see in our students in their particular setting. So I always try to kind of lean toward function um, and lean toward outcomes that are going to help us talk about, is this child, is this student going to be able to participate more effectively in the routines that they need to participate in? So, um, so while I mean, I, I, I certainly think that some of the sensory processing tools that we have available can certainly point out um, those changes. One of the things that I think is really salient with our school teams is when we say they can more effectively participate in, you know, circle time. They can more effectively manage their self-care routines. They can more effectively, you know, wh whatever it is. Um, so those types of outcomes are generally the things that are easier to sell. Um, they're easier to see, they're easier to sell to our school teams in terms of looking um, specifically at the, the contributions that we're making. Thank you. I think I was making it more complex because when you start thinking of data and I was like, oh, APS percentages. And then I was thinking SPM, maybe they can be a, but then I was thinking it's too complex. So function really helps me think of um, my three kiddos, what they're struggling with right now. Thank you. And even to say 10% for some kids, 1% is something to cheer about. Um, so I don't know, do you have to have a particular number? I'd see where you may be thinking that, but gosh, um, I, it's, small it's, success. it's worked really well with APS because when you look at APS2, it's actually very doable. Like the percentages could be like, it's out of 30. So a kid that moves up from three out of 30 to six or seven, I mean, that's a big percentage. I just was really trying to get my head around how can we measure regulation how we can go about doing that in a very practical way right 
And I was going to say the same thing that Patty said. I How would you know that they're better regulated? Right? Is it that there's going to be less behavioral outbursts? Is it going to be that they can stay at circle time? Is it going to be, you know, whatever? So that I would almost, and, and if you needed to have, if you're in a district who wants more um, um, quantitative type data, you can use um, goal attainment scaling or something like that. Um, because then you can make the um, goal or or you could even create a rubric um, and use that um, so that you've got something that's a little bit more um, definitive if you need if you need that but then you don't have to use a big huge assessment and 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 all of that but you can really make it individualized for that student I know at the star center um, where Lucy Miller has done a lot of her work in Denver, they use goal attainment scaling a lot to address a lot of the sensory needs and regulation because they found that that's a real effective way to do it without getting, you know, caught up with all the to all the other tools that are out there. And it seems more positive to talk about the goals and progression than it does to talk about a reduction in the number of times they had to go to time out or something yeah. like that. Just that's po more positive. And there's a lot of evidence around goal attainment scaling, using that as a measure of progress. So, I mean, if you're if you're in a district who really wants some of that data and that evidence uh, in a real um, research based way, not I don't want I don't know if research is I, they use it in research but I, it, it, there's just a lot of evidence with some of that that it's an effective tool i appreciate that i i think i was making it harder for myself as what you can mm -hmm. easily do i think all of us have done this with goal planning oh, yeah. right well, folks, we are out of time today, and I love that you're bringing your questions because that's what it's about. You have burning questions. Now Fiona has uh, some clarity in her direction, and, and that's how it works. So I'm uh, thrilled. Uh, we can go ahead and stop the recording.